Hello, today we have Phil as our esteemed guest. Um, Phil also studied at Cambridge. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, hi, Elia. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I, I also went to Cambridge, so I, I read law at Pembroke College before then going on to uh, qualify over in New York uh, as an attorney over there. And then finally coming back to London uh, in towards the end of 2019 now, uh, and then founding EZA, which uh, is an edtech startup that allows students to get help with their questions right within minutes. So sort of whenever you get stuck, you could get help from somebody um, who's, who's gonna, um, who, who's either a, a current student or also recent grad. So that's a little bit on, on me. Cool, thank you. Uh, I mean, yeah, we've already done a video together where we went through a few questions and then people commented their questions on that video and today we're going to go through those questions. And the first question I want to go through is how did we manage to do the workload at Cambridge? Um, well, yeah, Phil, would like to have a go at that first? Yeah, sure, I, I can kick us off. So I think with law, there's a, a massive reading reading workload. So you'll have this huge list that you get set both sort of before you start term and then also during term. Uh, so you'll you'll generally have about two weeks between each supervision and there is a lot of reading and not just the, rec the required reading but then there's this whole list of recommended stuff as well um, and I think that when you look at that just from the outset you think whoa that is way too much and to be honest I think that actually the reading that they give you is probably unrealistic like I don't think there's any way that you could possibly read all of that stuff within term time because you've got all this other stuff that's going on as well you don't just have your work, you've got the sports that you're doing or the other societies, uh, and then just even just turning up to lectures. So the way that I took it is like, I, I do most of the, the recommended reading um, as in like the required reading to, just so that I could then go ahead and write the, the, the essays or the assignments. And then, you know, further reading, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't do too much of it unless it turned out that while I was writing the essay, I did actually need it. So I think that the most important thing was actually just to be taking in the material. Um, I, I found that the lectures were super helpful as well because often the lecturers would actually summarize what was in some of the key reading so that rather than actually having to read the whole book or a couple of chapters even of it, the lecturer would literally just in five minutes go ahead and summarize the whole book and then also give their perspective on it. So that meant when, when I was coming into writing the essay, it was sort of like a bit of a hack it was, I already had whatever the, the lecturer had done to digest it, then had a little bit of a slant that I could then use in the essay and say, you know, X says Y on this sort of passage. And I think that this is really good um, because of, uh, of this uh, and apply a different perspective. So, I mean, to be honest with me, I, I, that was sort of the way that I would deal with it. It's sort of making sure that you can fit it in. I think that it's, there's a way to make everything manageable. It's just about splitting it down. Uh, but yeah, this was an essay based subject. Um, well, you've got problem sets as well in law. But I guess it's it's slightly different to what you will have done earlier, right? Yeah, so I did natural sciences, which uh, means that I did a variety of subjects like biology and chemistry and maths in my first year, for example. And in terms of managing the workload, well, a lot of the natural sciences course is just going to classes like lectures and practicals and supervisions. So first of all, turning up is a large proportion of your workload as opposed to like some humanities subjects where you have to kind of drive yourself, push yourself and do the reading mm. and essay writing. Um, but in addition to going to classes, you do need to do some studying. And when it comes to that, I think just being organized and efficient is the key thing. The thing about Cambridge, which makes it so difficult, in my personal opinion, isn't necessarily the difficulty of the content, like it is difficult. But what makes it stand out is the pace at which you learn content. Like mm. people will say, you learn stuff five times faster at Cambridge than you do at A-level. And that is potentially kind of true. Like it's insane how fast you have to learn stuff. And that's why being efficient and organized um, is, is key. Uh, additionally, you do, or like I think most people do inevitably fall behind on work, which means you do just spend the vacations yeah. catching up. Um, I personally had to do that. Um, did you have to do that as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was some other person, I think it was actually a friend who was at Oxford and said that their professor or their, their they called them their dons or whatever. Anyway, their, their like director of studies equivalent basically said, you know, vacations, they're not holidays, they're vacations because you've left the premises, but you're still expected to work. So yeah, definitely yeah, would agree with that. Yeah, definitely. And 
honestly, I think it kind of is to an extent a good idea to fall behind a bit because Cambridge is like a great place to learn new things, not just like academically, but like meet new people, try new things, get involved in different societies. And I don't yeah. think it's a good idea to just focus on the academics whilst you're at university. So I think it is helpful and important to also try the other things associated with university that are not just the um, academic bits. They often say, like your college will say, you should always like put your academics first and then like your socials or sports or whatever second. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I would say like if you like if you need to do this work but you've got a social at this time might as well just like do the work around the social uh, whilst they suggest the opposite but personally I would suggest like make it fit so that you can do both um, I mean the terms are so short as well right like eight yeah. literally eight weeks there's not even a reading week in, in between like it is it is so short so uh, yeah. you know, if you want to, if you want to do stuff outside of term, like you will, you will probably have to do some work outside of term time. And while yeah. you're there, you wanna, you wanna actually sort of make the most of it. Um, yeah. Plus, the good thing is that it's not like the U.S. system where you've actually got a grade point average. Literally, you could, you could technically do all of the work at the end and then fill it out of the bag, as some people do do. Um, it's obviously pretty yeah. difficult. You need to do some work, but in theory, you can just do loads of revision in the Easter before exams uh, and then sort of just do really well. Yeah, and like to an extent, that does happen a lot. Like people do just kind of fall behind throughout the year, but then just really work hard during Easter term, like the third term. Yeah. Uh, but that is a bit risky and potentially very, very <laughs> stressful. Um, I think the ideal balance is to kind of stay on top of work, catch up during the vacations, and work hard during exam season. Um, but it's like yeah. up to you what you want to do exactly. Yeah, I mean. And, so you mentioned that you you did get graded a little bit on participation, like turning up for some stuff. Was that is that like something? Um, is that I like didn't labs say that, but yeah, yeah. We so for some for some things you do lead to like some some labs are assessed. Yeah, it depends like what the subject okay. it is and what labs. Um, but some labs you okay. need to turn up, or else you like lose marks. Okay. okay. Um, or like for a lot of stuff, like um, we had like practicals, like we go to the lab, but then like. Um, you wouldn't be assessed on that, but then at the end of the year, you'll have a written exam. We have to talk about what you do in those labs, so it's indirectly assessed. Right. Yeah. No, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Very, very different than to law, which is pretty much just all in the exam. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and also, just to add to how to manage the work, like just being organised and efficient is really important. Like you can't afford to just spend multiple hours a day on your phone or procrastinating or watching Netflix. Like you do have to be efficient and organized if you want to like stay on top of everything uh, like in my first year my first time at Cambridge I think that was when I was most on top of everything because like in in that in that two month period in that first time I watched 40 minutes of Netflix no nothing else um, sometimes these days I watch that in a day but like back then it was just either working or I don't know, socializing yeah. or doing sport. It was like constantly doing something. Uh, but it does tire you out. And towards like third year, it was much less um, working, much more balanced, I guess. Yeah, some people go the other way around. I guess it, it, it depends. Like some people will spend the whole whole first year doing nothing and then gradually get more and more it sort of serious as they come into year yeah. two and then year three and then maybe in year, year yeah. four. But you, you do it the other way around then. Yeah, I think there is an element of you come better at doing work um, and not only that, but mm. I think there is less work, maybe more difficult work, but I think there is less work um, mm. throughout your degree. Like I do definitely feel I went from first year, second year, third year in terms of difficulty. Okay. Um, that's my personal that's experience, yeah. Do you yeah. think that's because the workload Although, was actually like, actually became lower or just that you did, did become like way more efficient at doing it? I think there was less workload, like contact hours wise, first year you are scheduled to have about 28 hours a week and by third year okay. it was a lot less. So I think there is oh, yeah. less work. Um, it might be harder to work, but I think it definitely is less, but also you do become more efficient and you become more tactical. Like I don't yeah. think it's really realistic to be able to learn everything in first year, natural sciences, and yeah. you do have to be tactical, like you have to um, learn specific modules and kind of cut corners and um that is a key skill in life cutting corners uh but knowing which corners to cut <laughs> yeah um yeah yeah 
That's, I was just sort of interested because I guess for, for law, it's, it is again flipped a little bit because in first year you'll only take like four modules and then in second and third year you'll take five each. So traditionally first year is viewed as like, I guess technically being a little bit of a, uh, a lighter year and then it ramps up in two and three. So maybe it, it probably differs from course to course as well. Yeah, no, it does vary. Like second year medicine is meant to be notorious, um, like harder than first year or third year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, let's move on to a similar question, which is how did you revise for the tripos exams, like the end of year exams? Would you say there's just too much information to remember everything? Um, I think we did just kind of answer that as in personally, I feel that there is usually just too much to learn and you have to be tactical yeah in your revision, you should like go through the um, exam rubric and be like, what questions from which topics come up? What can I afford not to learn? Um, I think often the format of the exam is meant that you'd answer three questions out of like eight topics and to be safe, you should like, I don't know, learn five or six, depending on like yeah. uh, the exam. Uh, how do you feel yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I almost forgotten about that, actually. You can be super tactical about it. So yeah, you're, I think for a lot of the papers, we would have like eight questions, exactly. And then you, you do about four. So yeah, you'd want to you'd wanna revise for six and then hope that, you know, well, you're almost guaranteed that one of those or, or the four of those that you need to answer will come up. And then the, you want to leave yourself a little bit of leeway so that if a subject that you're not too strong on comes up, that you know you are able to still to answer it like you know, maybe maybe those four that you are really good at um one just has a weird angle that you don't want to answer or something weird and esoteric that the examiner just decided to throw in so that you can do like the fifth and sixth one um so yeah definitely be, be really tactical about it and then i think as well the other thing uh, to note is that it's different from a levels and gcse's where you have a, a syllabus at least uh, for law uh, you know when i first came in, I was like, okay, where's the syllabus? How do I figure out what I need to learn for the exam? You know, I'm just going to check those off like we used to do for revision at school. Uh, when there is actually no set syllabus, um, where the sort of the, the examiner is going ahead and saying, look, I can test you on this, this, and this. So was, if you know all of that, there's nothing else that I could test you on. It's, it, it's a bit more fluid than that. Um, so the real key to Tripos, at least for law, is to go ahead and have a look at the past papers and see what kind of questions come in year in year out. Uh, there is a, I guess there are examiners favorites for what they do want to test you on. So if you'd figure out what those favorites are, you'll be able to align yourself really well with what's probably going to come up uh, this year. I mean, like that's, that's again law, but for, for Natsuki, is that similar? Like, is there a syllabus that you can rely on or is it still like th there's stuff that they will, that they'll probably test you on because they're going to be teaching it to you, but there's no like checkbox where you can say, okay, I've revised this done and then sort of move on to the next thing. Yeah, exactly. Like in general at university, there's no syllabus. So you can't like, as you said, a GCSC and A-level just memorize the syllabus. You can't do that anymore. There is no syllabus to memorize and yeah. it is kind of up to you to decide, times. is this worth learning? <laughs> it's up to you to decide whether something is worth learning or, or not. But although there is no syllabus, there is a massive advantage uh, that we do have compared to A-level and GCSE, which is that if your answer is right, you'll get the marks. At A-level GCSE, mm. if your answer was not in the mark scheme, but it was yeah. correct, you probably wouldn't get the marks. But now you're kind of much more free. Like literally you can write anything, anything you want, but if it's correct, if it's like a good argument, you'll get the marks. Uh, and that's what's kind of nice about it. Uh, additionally, as you kind of get further through your degree, like for natural sciences at least, you do end up coming across content, which is kind of, um, like where, we, where we, we, we reach the limits of science. And at that point, your essays become more kind of argumentative and like you have to provide evidence. And um, in third year, you literally cannot get a, a top mark if you don't include content that wasn't in the course. Like you literally mm. have to include extra content from beyond uh, yeah. the class. Um, and therefore, yeah, you, you can't do well if you just use content from lectures and there's no syllabus anyway. Yeah, it's worth looking at the uh, what the class what the classes are actually defined as because I think for first class it's like they provide a perspective which is you know unique and insightful, and then for a start first it's like something that they hadn't even thought of really before, like something that's a genuinely new perspective on it. So 
I, I think that that is actually pretty useful too. And I think there was a you know, one of my supervisors used to say that um, for you know for a two one you can think about it or or a first or a start first. Like you can think about it in terms of the weather. You know, two one the examiner is basically thinking, you know, this is yeah the weather's good. You know, it's partly cloudy, but it's mostly sunny. It's dry. You can go outside. Um, for a first, you know, the the examiner's thinking, wow, it's a beautiful day. And for a start first, which is I guess the top top then it's like, wow, this is a really, really glorious day. You know, I wanna, I wanna take this person into my, um, to my supervision, I wanna have them, and I wanna actually talk to them a little bit further about what they actually wrote in that paper because it's something which was so interesting. So having sort of that in your mind when you go and think about how I can get a top mark in Tripos. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting <laughs> analogy. Um, yeah, and like, if you include literally no content from your lectures, but you do a good essay and you answer the question, that's that's good. Like you'll get top mark. You literally, don't have to include lecture content to do well in your classes, which is a bit of a, uh, a weird way to think about it. Um, but it's true. And like um, you might have seen a video Ali Abdal made, where he talked about how he topped his year in Cambridge in third year, and he talked about how um, when preparing essay plans, he would just like Google the question and like look for answers there, and only once he'd um, found a lot of content on Google, he would look at the lecture notes to supplement his essay plans. And I think okay. that's a very good way around okay. going it. And that helps explain how he managed to get such a high score in his exams. Yeah, no, I haven't actually seen that, but I, uh, yeah, that's uh, for anybody watching, probably, you should probably watch that one. <laughs> yeah, obviously for some courses like maths uh, and medicine, there is like maybe not a syllabus exactly, but there are certain things you do need to know um, and I guess in, for maths in particular, you do need to know certain things. But I guess more humanities like subjects or even like what I did, which is kind of like biology, you can mm -hmm. get away with just um, by answering the question properly. You can write, you can get away with writing anything as long as you answer the question properly. Yeah, I don't know. For medicine, I'd be um, I'd be a bit a bit concerned if sort of this uh, this medic was just coming up with some novel way of treating a treating a disease. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, and then next question, um, how did you make your flashcards? Uh, and then in brackets, essay plans or short answer questions? Um, okay, did you make flashcards? No, no, not a fan of flashcards at all. I missed, uh, missed the no flashcards. Um, yeah, I just found that they were a, a bit of a waste of time. Like just, they would take way too much time to, uh, to make. Uh, and so what I would just do instead is really focus on those Triforce Pass paper questions. Um, you know, often just write the essay uh, and then once I found some that were sort of relatively repetitive, I would just go ahead and write essay plans for them, make sure that I'm doing them timed as well. And I found that that was the most effective use of time. So, you know, I was able to do the same amount of work uh, in like 10% of the time just by doing those or, or get to like that level um, in, in a fraction of, of the time rather than making flashcards. Because then like with flashcards, you need to find where everything is in the textbook. You need to then, uh, or, or in your lecture notes, you need to then make the flashcards. You need to then test yourself on it. Whereas Actually, if I found that if I would just go and dive right in, it, you know, it seems scary at first just to start writing those exam papers, even in timed conditions. Uh, but I found that that was just the most efficient way to prepare rather than doing flashcards. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to be tested on flashcards. Um, it's not like you're going to, in, in the exam, you're going to have like all of these questions or, you know, maybe a GCSE where you used to just get asked like a one marker and say, you know, what is the... I don't know, what is the equation of photosynthesis or something like that, which lends itself very well to a flashcard format. Triforce, you know, the, the exams, like, they're not like that. Uh, and so for me, I, I just thought that, you know, flashcards wouldn't really be the, the best way to prepare. So I was just really just going going ahead and answering the real questions and then making plans off the back of those. Okay, uh, that's fair enough. For my first year, I used flashcards in my end of year exams. I used Anki flashcards. I only discovered it at towards the end of the year, quite close to exam season. But I discovered at a time when I was very much struggling with memorizing content. There was so much content to memorize and I didn't have a good enough system to memorize so much content. And then when I started using Anki flashcards, I was able to very quickly memorize a massive amount of content. And I think that very much helped me. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of my flashcards, they were, I guess, short answer questions. Um, but what I think would have helped me get better grades in essay writing subjects is if I prepared essay plans. And that is something I did not do, which I think I, mm. I should have done. Uh, I did very well in the chemistry and maths uh, exams, but I did not as well in the uh, 
biology exams, which were essay based. And, and therefore, I think writing essay plans is very, very helpful, probably the best thing you can do for preparing for essays. Um, but if you have a lot of content to learn, um, I think flashcards, in my opinion, are a very good idea, particularly Anki flashcards, if you're not familiar with them. And so Anki, that's where like, you'll put them in and then it will show you the ones that you do badly on more often, right? So the ones that basically the idea is like, if you, the stuff that you know, you shouldn't be tested on again, and then stuff you don't know, you should be tested on more frequently. Is that right? No, exactly. Yeah. So the way it works is yeah. you make your flashcard and then if you go through your flashcards, um, I'll show you the question, you write down the answer or whatever you want to do, and then it shows you the answer. And then um, there's a few buttons you can click depending on how well you knew the answer. So you're like very okay. good, not so good, bad, very bad. And depending on what you answer, that will determine when you see the card next. If you knew it really well, you'll see it in, I don't know, two weeks time. If you didn't know it well at all, if you didn't remember it at all, you'll see it in five minutes time. And that's okay. how you can memorize so many flashcards um, in like without too much effort. Like if you just spend 20 minutes a day doing Anki, you can memorize thousands of flashcards. Like I have a friend who studies languages and she was using yeah. it for vocabulary and she had 20,000 Anki flashcards, which is like an insane number. Um, yeah. But it uh, very much helped her. Like she came, I think, like first or second in her year. Um, so oh, wow. like it very much helped her. Um, so I think Anki yeah, is a very me, powerful like, way to memorize content quickly. Like how long does it take to, to make those 20,000 flashcards though? Like that's gonna take at least a minute per flashcard, right? I think you can't go faster than that. So that's like 20,000 minutes um, just making flashcards. You could do it faster. Um, there's a few things to note. First of all, like if it's vocab, it's just like, word word so it's like very short flashcards and if you're just like writing one word and writing another word um that should only take i don't know like a couple of seconds like 10 seconds if you are doing it quickly Additionally, okay. you can just use flashcards made by other people like if there's ready-made right. flashcards for what you want just download them so you don't need to make your own flashcard necessarily um so i think overall it's an investment and additionally making the flashcards is part of the learning process like writing it down mm -hmm. as a question and an answer helps you understand and therefore learn the content as well yeah yeah that's fair enough like is there is there one for for Natsuki, like or for different modules that the year above have made before like then they'll, they'll share with the year belows they do exist like some colleges have for like Natsuki. i've heard uh, like a google drive where people get content i made one it didn't really take off but my anki flashcards do exist um, somewhere in a Google Drive. Yeah, you should. <laughs> you should. You should fish them out at some point. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. Let's move on to the next question, which is: Did you do an internship during any of your undergrad years, um, Phil? Yeah, I did. So uh, for law, because like pretty much everybody wants to go and get a training contract with a law firm, which is basically the route to becoming a qualified lawyer. Um, a lot of people are applying for these things called vacation schemes. So these aren't a lot of them aren't actually available after first year. So traditionally, second year like is the big year if you want to do those those internships at the law firm. So I did two. Um, I did one with um, a, U, a UK firm, so Linklaters, and then I did another one with a US firm, Sullivan and Cromwell. Um, and then basically, traditionally, at the end, you'll get your training contract. And so at the end of that, I had my training contract with uh, Sullivan and Cromwell. Um, and then sort of went to, went and worked with them after graduating. So yeah, those those are the ones I did. And you'll you basically you'll prepare at the sort of around around winter time of so your first term of second year, and then you'll get offered them sort of in the in the second term to go in and start in the summer. But those ones were were relatively short. Some of them were I think one of them was like three weeks. The other one was like two weeks, or basically around like a month and then two weeks. Um, for those actual vacation schemes. So I did do them. They give you like a, a flavor of what you want to go into. Uh, in first year, I did a little bit as well, although that wasn't law related. So, I mean, since the summer is so long, I'd, I'd, I personally would really recommend at least applying for something. Um, and then it will give you a good flavor of what you want to do. So like, if you want to, if you think you want to do investment banking, go and do an investment banking internship. Um, and then also you'll get your job offer off the back of that. So it means that when you're going into year three, you don't have to be scrambling and like, worrying about trying to get a job after you graduate you've just got that in the bag you've already got your offer you know where you're going to work and then you can just focus on sort of enjoying year three and also focusing on getting the the grade that you want at the end of year three because um the, well, the thing about uh, cambridge at least is that your or, or and law uh, cambridge i think is for most degrees actually 
your your final grade at the end of uh, your degree is really just based on your final year. So you want to go ahead and yeah. smash that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, fair enough. I think there is very much um, this big internship, summer internship culture. I'm not sure if it's specific to Cambridge, but I think it probably is like um, a massive thing in like university students globally. Um, I wasn't very uh, well... I didn't know much about this like internship culture before I got to Cambridge. And I wasn't particularly interested in following a corporate route, which is why I didn't personally pursue those kind of yeah. internships. I did, however, do a kind of internship between my first and second year, which was in uh, a lab in Cambridge. I just spent like eight weeks um, doing like research um, as part of um, this lab in the zoology department. And all I did was just like ask my director of studies, like, can I do an internship with someone in the department? They just put me in touch with someone and that's it. I just, you know, turned up to the lab for eight weeks in the summer. I didn't get paid for it, but I did apply for funding from my college and the department and they each gave me a bit of money which covered my food and rent. So I didn't like end up making a loss. And then during my second and third year, I was going to do uh, another research internship but because of COVID, it fell apart. So I didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a good point. Like, I guess there's not really any, if you don't want to go down the corporate route, then there's not really much of a point in, in going for one of those other internships. Apart from that, yeah, a lot of them will pay you pro rata. So that's a good thing. It's like a work experience plus a bit of a job. I think it does look good on your CV. Like, I think that getting in an internship at a prestigious firm does look good on your CV. And as you mentioned, it pays well. Like, you can get a lot of money from internships. Um, like, you do hear about people getting, like, if you do an internship at, like, a finance firm, um, like Jane Street, you can earn £20,000 in two months. Like, massive sums of money, um, to me, at least. Um, so, money reasons, you might want to do it. Plus, it looks good on your CV even if you're not interested in the corporate route. Plus, it might help you decide whether you want to go corporate in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, and now on to the final question, which is any tips for someone who's considering applying to do a master's at Cambridge as an international student? Yeah, I guess this is this is over to you since I never applied, uh, applied for the master's. Okay, uh, as a student who's currently doing a master's at Cambridge, I might be in a all right position to answer that <laughs> so first of all find out what course you want to apply for there's like a massive list of courses on the cambridge website and make sure that the course you apply to is the one you're really interested in and then you need to do your research find out what the dates and deadlines and requirements are and make sure you fill those requirements um, with like sufficient time um, and also very important is you look at funding deadlines if you want to get funding the deadlines can be quite early. Like for me, it was I think December or January, the deadline for funding. Um, I didn't get the funding, unfortunately, but I needed to uh, apply well in advance. Um, masters vary a lot. Like my masters, I'm doing an MPhil in biological sciences. It's completely research-based. Like I'm literally in a lab right now and it's just research, um, whilst other masters can be purely taught or like partially taught. Mm. Um, so they're very a lot and therefore the application process varies like for my masters i had to write a project proposal and how i did that was i got in touch with the prospective supervisor um, he was interested in having me and together we worked on a project proposal which i then submitted as part of my application but if you're doing a taught masters then you probably won't have to do a project proposal or anything like that um, so the point is you need to know what the application format is and you can find that out um, online and yeah, make sure you meet funding deadlines. Um, and basically everything you need to know is available online. So you just need to do your research. Yeah, I mean, maybe like, I guess as, as somebody who hasn't, uh, who didn't really apply for the master's, maybe, I mean, the couple of questions that come to mind might be helpful for um, for some of the other people watching. Like, so obviously your undergrad, like traditionally is not like funded. I mean, you can get student loans um, to do your, your undergrad. But you mentioned funding for the master's and I thought like, that funding was only really available for PhDs because like you're not going to do a three year PhD without actually being funded like because you also need to pay for like the labs and, and stuff like that I think as a PhD or like basically you need you need quite a bit of money in addition to just being able to live so that sort of thing is sort of available for for masters or is it just is it more like something that's optional rather than for, for the PhD which is like you, you really need to have it 
Okay, um, so for PhDs, you're very most people who do PhDs do receive funding, but there are people who are self-funded PhDs. They do exist, okay. but they're quite rare because that's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, usually, master's students don't get funding. I think in Cambridge, like a fifth or something of master's students get funding. Um, right. It's much harder to get, and they can be surprisingly cheap like my master's is eight and a half thousand pounds per year which sounds like a lot of money but it's cheaper than undergrad and yeah if you do an english master's it's sixteen thousand pounds a year at cambridge uh, because my course is not taught it's a lot cheaper um yeah do keep in mind though that my lab needs to spend money for my research um so yeah. i don't pay for like my experiments the lab pays for them and same for a phd like you don't pay to use the lab the your like um supervisor's bank account will pay for that um but yeah, most people at masters don't get funding, um, but okay. it can sometimes be not as expensive as you might think. If you're an international student, though, it's going to be a lot more expensive. A lot more expensive. Like, how much would your masters cost as an international student? Do, would you know? I can guess the order of magnitude will probably be twenty, thirty k or something like that. I I don't yeah. know exactly. Because so I think like for like, like for Natsuki undergrad, is it almost like forty or fifty k for as it's an international around student? that? Yeah. It's around yeah. that, so it's a huge sum of money. If you if you don't get a scholarship and you're not financially well off, you would struggle to pay uh, as a student at Cambridge. Yeah, and that is that like so. Does that include accommodation in the college? So you're like as a master student, you're still like affiliated with the college and everything like that. Yep. So I'm currently a member of Jesus College, and I'm just a postgraduate student at Jesus College. I chose to live in college accommodations so i'm living in a house with a few of my friends owned by college it's just like a cross college site um so okay, that's cool. similar to undergrad i think the good thing about doing like postgrad in the uk is you're still part of you're still part of the college like you still you can still do sports in the same sports teams because i think in the us you can only do like varsity sports if you're an undergrad and if you're a postgrad it's like you know you're a postgrad you know like you're, you're not you're part of the university but you're not part of like a particular college because they don't really have the college system in a lot of yeah. uh, a lot of the universities um and then yeah you can't even like participate in the sports so it's uh, a very different world whereas i could assume that you're pretty much able to do you know, like or at least when i was doing water polo like you've got phds playing you've got master students playing like there's not really that massive sort of difference between being an undergrad and actually being a postgrad yeah, like in my case, the transition from undergrad to postgrad is quite seamless because like I'm living on the same street, I'm living with the same people, um, I'm just like, I'm still involved with the same societies, the only difference is I don't have classes, I just go to the lab and do research and it's a nice change actually, I do like it. Yeah, if you hadn't done the masters, what would, would, you, would you have done, like if you hadn't got the masters? <laughs> I guess we'll never know. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess like you, because you you want to go down the like like the route of academia, right? You want to do the PhD afterwards. I'm planning on applying for PhD next year. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I guess for me, yeah, it wasn't necessarily on the on the roadmap, but yeah, I guess yeah, it's uh, oh, I'm going to be getting my my Cantab Masters soon. But that's oh, nice. About it. Yeah. So if you don't know, Cambridge lets you apply for a Masters conversion thing, as in you do your undergrad and then you can apply for that to be converted to a Masters a few years after you graduate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. I think that's all the questions I have. Do you have any questions you wanted to go through? No, I think that that's pretty much it. Thanks so much, everybody, for, for submitting your questions last time. And best of luck, I guess, if you're applying for a master's or if you're doing Tripos soon or if you're just applying as well. So, uh, yeah, good luck, everybody. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks for having me on. See you earlier.